Professor Griffiths is an Australia Research Council Laureate Fellow and a Chalice uh, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney, Australia. He is based at the Charles Perkins Center, an interdisciplinary biomedical research institute, where he uh, co-leads the theory and the method in biosciences group with Pierrick Bois. Uh, Pierrick was invited for a Friday lecture last semester. And uh, Professor Griffiths is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales, and a former president of the International Society for History, Philosophy, and the Social Studies of Biology. And uh, his work uh, involves many important topics He has published more than 200 professional journal articles. According to Google Scholar, his uh, works have more than 14,000 citations, uh, which is very impressive. His well-known books include What Emotions Really Are, The Problem of Psychological Categories. This is a book about evolution of emotion. And uh, Sex and the Death, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Biology, it has been a classical textbook for uh, students and uh, people the, on the philosophy of biology and the genetics and the philosophy and introduction, which has been an essential philosophical work on genetics. And recently, he has been working on the selective effects mm -hmm. approach to teleology and uh, has wants to rethink adaptationism. This will be the major topics for today and the tomorrow's lectures. And uh, let me add that Professor Griffiths has been to China several times. As I remember, as early as 2011, which is 11 years ago, Paul uh, was one of the four teachers for philosophy summer school in China, Zhongyin Mei Shu Qi Zhe Xue Xue Yan in Chinese, uh, which I believe was the first event, the event where many of our online audience today who know Paul first met Paul. Uh, he has been the supervisor for several visiting students from China, including me uh, and other people, and the one PhD Chinese student, Wesley Fang, Fang Wei, uh, who is in Shanxi University, uh, who I believe is also online now, maybe not. Uh, it is a pity that currently we cannot uh, meet posts uh, uh, through face to face, but only through screen, and uh, hope next time we can uh, meet face to face. And uh, next, we will have a uh, uh, talking from Paul, and then we have about one hour for discussion. Questions first from the room, and then from online audience. Uh, if you, for online audience, if you have any questions during Paul's talk, you can uh, type in the chat box, and uh, we will uh, ask one by one. Okay, so the title of today's talk is can traits be explained by their biological functions uh, let's warmly welcome Paul great um, thank you it's a very nice lovely introduction from Dr. Chao Ying Lu there which I much appreciate and yes one day hopefully we will be able to uh, to travel freely again and I shall see many of you face to face I'm going to uh, share my screen now um where are we and show you the slides and good so can we all see the slides now yes great okay so this is um uh, an article written with uh my collaborator Pierrick Barat and some of our postdoctoral fellows have all contributed to different bits of the paper um, and the paper is forthcoming as a target article in the Australian Philosophical Review which is a journal that publishes target articles with invited responses and also um, an open call for responses where you can submit um, a response to our paper so um, it will appear probably next year with invited commentaries by uh, Ruth Millikan and uh, Nicholas Shea and Samira Kasha, as well as um, somebody else from New Zealand who's escaping me. But anyway, um, 
So there'll be four invited commentaries. But if you're interested in this topic, there will be the possibility to um, submit a commentary which will be reviewed and some of them will be published along with the target article. So we're all very much looking forward to the published responses um, that will appear in the journal eventually. So. Oh, there we go. So what we're talking about today is biological teleology. And many of you will be very well aware that it's a very persistent idea in Western thought that living things have goals and purposes and that the parts and processes of living things have a purpose or a function. So obviously that's um, an idea that's very familiar from uh, Aristotle's teleological view of the world, from the idea that all events have a final cause, a purpose for which they occur. But the idea survived the collapse of the Aristotelian view of the world as full of purpose in the 17th century. And while Western science abandoned the idea that physical processes have a purpose or a goal, the idea that living processes have a purpose or a goal has remained very widely accepted and very intuitive. Numerous great philosophers have tried to make sense of this idea. Um, are we having trouble with the image? I'm I'm seeing somebody adjusting the camera. Uh, I think you can just continue and uh, we'll okay, I'll just carry on. Okay, that's right. It's funny this little face in front of the screen. Okay, um, <laughs> so very famously, uh, Immanuel Kant, in his uh, critique of judgment, argued that although living things don't really have any intrinsic goal or purpose. It's necessary for the human understanding that we treat them as if they do. So this is Kant's famous epistemological interpretation of biological teleology. So biological teleology, Kant thought, is not real, but it's necessary for human beings to treat living things as if they are teleological, if we're to understand and to make sense of them. So you can see from Kant's response to the problem of biological teleology that goals and purposes were things that it was difficult to fit within the scientific view of the world. In the scientific view of the world, things merely happen because of their physical causes, and there doesn't seem to be any role for the idea of processes occurring for a reason or having a goal or an end um, having been directed towards something beyond themselves. But in the mid 20th century, there were two new approaches within the natural sciences, which made this idea suddenly seem unproblematic. And these two ways of thinking about biological teleology are still present in the main approaches to analyzing the idea of goals or purposes in biology in contemporary philosophy. One of these sets of ideas was cybernetics, the new inf sciences of information. So the word cybernetics is not used as much now as it was 50 years ago, but it's the, one of the first words that was used to express the emergence of the new sciences of computation and the construction of goal-directed machinery. And these three scientists, Rosenbluth, Norbert Weiner, and Julian Bigelow, produced an article in the middle of the Second World War in the journal Philosophy of Science, explaining how the new technologies that were being developed in the 1940s enabled us to build machines, which were in a very straightforward sense, seeking to perform a goal. So machines which had some of the properties we associate with living things, rather than simply mechanically following some simple laws, they adjust themselves in order to achieve the same goal, they respond to changing external circumstances by finding a different pathway to achieve the car. That cybernetic approach to teleology expressed in contemporary philosophical uh, Matteo Mossio, 
but it's easy to find, particularly in European writers, um, cybernetic ways of thinking about teleology. But the way of thinking about teleology that dominates the English speaking world, so approaches to this philosophical problem in American, Australian, British, Anglo, Anglophone philosophy, draws instead on a Darwinian approach to biological teleology. It sees not cybernetics and the information sciences, but the theory of natural selection, Darwin's theory of evolution, as the scientific uh, framework within which biological teleology can be made to appear unproblematic and just part of our physical scientific view of the world. And the, the classic paper here was published by a biologist called Colin Petendry in 1958, and it introduced a, a new word, teleonomy, which, as you, you can see, is uh, um, it's simply a related Greek word to the original word teleology, whereas teleology means study of purpose, teleonomy simply means the laws of purpose. And so this new word was introduced, and there's some good historical scholarship on this in the history of science. It was introduced to show that this way of thinking about biological teleology had nothing to do with the ideas of Aristotle or the ideas that have been criticized and analyzed by Immanuel Kant, that it was a new scientific way of thinking about biological teleology. And to mark that break, Petendry and others introduced this word teleonomy. We don't use it very much anymore. We tend to just talk about Darwinian or biological approaches to understanding teleology. But in the 1950s, it was important for people to, to signal that they were doing something new, something that was based on Darwin's theory of natural selection, and thus avoiding the idea that teleology is something mysterious or emergent or something that can't be rigorously understood in a materialist science. Now, what I'm talking about today, the selected effects theory of proper function, is simply a contemporary philosophical approach that fits within this framework of teleonomy. So if we read a contemporary philosopher, Karen Neander, um, in an acclaimed book on selected effects accounts of function in 2017, she writes, the gist of this theory is that the function of an item is what it's selected to do. So that the core of her theory, the heart of her theory, is that if you ask what something is for, you're asking what it was designed to do by natural selection. And we can find exactly similar statements in biologists writing many decades earlier. Um, this is Conrad Lorenz, who was the founder of the modern Darwinian science of animal behavior. And in one of his books, he writes, if we ask, what does a cat have sharp curved claws for? and answer simply to catch mice with. This does not imply a profession of any mythical teleology, but the plain statement that catching mice is the function whose survival value by the process of natural selection has bred cats with this particular form of claw. So we can see that contemporary philosophers are simply drawing on a long-standing tradition in Darwinian biology of saying that when you think about goals or purposes or why, why something exists or what it's for, you're asking questions about the role of that trait in natural selection. What did claws do that made them so useful that they were selected and we still see them today? So the selected effects theory is a theory of what uh, philosophers call proper function. I'll talk about that idea more in a minute. It's a naturalist and realist account of biological teleology, and it's very popular in contemporary Anglophone philosophy. The reason it's so popular is that it seems to give us... A, uh, somebody, somebody has their microphone turned on. Sorry, uh, now I'm Okay. Yeah, good. Sorry. Um, so the reason this 
idea is so pop value in the philosophy of language, the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of medicine, and elsewhere. So in the philosophy of language, people appeal to this way of thinking about biological teleology in order to distinguish between when uh, language is working successfully and when language is failing. In the philosophy of mind, it's used in a very parallel way to distinguish between when mental representations are succeeding, they're representing the world, they're true or correct, and when they're failing, they're misrepresenting the world, they're false or they're incorrect. So the idea is that we can take these really problematic ideas in philosophy How can what say that it in it correctly? These can be analyzed as statements about whether language or the mind are performing their proper functions, whether they're doing what they evolved to do. So the idea is that when a sentence is false, the mechanism that produced that sentence is not performing in the way that it was designed to perform by a natural selection. When a mind thinks makes a mistake when your mind makes some kind of a mistake your mind is not performing in the way that it went to perform by natural selection the distinction between health and disease has been analyzed by a number of philosophers by appealing to the idea that a healthy body is one that can perform the functions that it evolved to perform is doing what it designed was designed to do by natural selection and an unhealthy body is one that is failing to do what it was evolved what it what evolution designed it to do so this has given rise to at least in english speaking philosophy a very strong and widespread support for the selected effects theory of proper function so what do we mean by proper function? Uh, the idea is that um, we can think about function in various ways, more strictly or more loosely, but the proper functions of a trait are its real functions, um, the functions that we can properly appeal to, to, uh, to judge whether the trait is functional or dysfunctional. So, um, to give you, uh, perhaps I could give an example. Um, uh, it might be um, very useful in the army. If you have a broken leg, you don't have to go and serve in the army. That could be really useful. So we could say that the function of your broken leg is to keep you out of the army. But we don't think that that's the real function of your leg. We think that the proper function of the leg is for walking, for locomotion, and a broken leg is broken, dysfunctional. It can't perform its proper function. So the sort of the serious real, and then you could think about it that way if you wanted to, but it isn't really what the function of that part is. So this phrase proper function is it's useful the idea that some function of philosophical theories of function is to understand that okay so a key text in establishing the selected effects view of function and the idea that only selected effect functions are proper functions was the american philosopher ruth millikan's language thought and other biological categories published in 1984 and in this very influential book, Millikan argued that the distinction between truth and falsity, between correct representation and misrepresentation, could be analyzed by asking what the proper functions of representations are. And you could understand proper function using this selected effect theory of function. Another early influential work, it was actually never published, but widely read, was by the Australian philosopher Karen Neander, who in her PhD thesis argued that you could distinguish um, mental health 
from mental illness. So you could distinguish a normal, healthy mind from an abnormal, unhealthy mind by asking whether the mind is performing its proper function, whereby proper function you mean, is it performing its selected effects? Is the mind doing the things that it was designed by natural selection to do? Now, these are all controversial theories, but broadly in philosophy today, it's very easy to find people appealing to the selected effect to count of function whenever they need to give a scientific account of the idea that something is succeeding or failing, that it's functioning correctly or malfunctioning, that it's intact or broken, that it's correct or mistaken, that it's healthy or it's diseased. Whenever people are looking for a scientific way of thinking about what's normal and what's abnormal, the tendency is to reach for the selected effect theory of function. It makes room in the scientific view of the world for normativity. The most recent example of this is a book by the American philosopher Justin Garson, which revives Karen Neander's 1983 idea and tries to explain how mental illness is the, always the failure of the brain to perform the functions for which it was designed by natural selection. Now, a few years after these books came out, um, various people, including me, um, published papers saying, look, there are two senses of function. There's this kind of really serious sense of proper function, but there's another looser notion of function in which to say that something has a function is just to say that it can do something, okay? My broken leg can keep me out of the army. That's true. Um, we could talk, I mean, I'll give you a, perhaps a less silly example. If you're a, a pathologist, if you're a medical scientist who studies illness, you might ask what the function of a particular gene is in cancer. Now, obviously, the gene didn't evolve in order to produce cancer, but you can still look at the growth of the cancer and ask what function does this gene in the group sense of function? And so in this paper by Peter Godfrey Smith and another paper at the same time by me, we basically argued that in order to look at how biologists use the language of function, you need both a weak sense of function called causal role function, where saying that something has a function is just a way of describing what it can do. And then on the other side, you have a strong notion of function the notion of proper function, what is this thing really for? And that strong notion of function allows you to say normative things about the trait, whereas the weaker notion of function calls a role function doesn't allow you to say normative things about the state. So something can't bowl function, broken its disease. So that's the kind of consensus view that you'll find in most introductions to philosophy of biology. And what I want to talk about today is why good as we've thought it, we have thought it to be for the last few decades. So Why do people take the idea of selected effect functions so seriously and what's E functions from now? People think are really what it's for. It's its true function, its proper function. And the the key argument for that is that effect functions explain why the things that have those functions exist. So here are some quotes uh, from Karen Neander again, talking about the uh, uh, very pretty but rapidly going extinct Australian koala bear. She says that the koala's pouch 
has the function of protecting its young, does seem to explain why koans is for directing other bees to pollen, does seem to explain why bees dance. And she goes on to say, my view is that function attributions universally and intrinsically justify teleological explanations. So what she's saying is we can explain why living things are the way they are, why they have various parts and processes. We can explain it teleologically by pointing to their function. This thing exists because it has this function. This thing is the shape it is because it has this function. And why can functions do this? Functions have this explanatory power because she says of, quote, a causally explanatory selection process during which those items or traits were selected for those effects which are their function. So the idea is functions are such great explanations because the function is a way of pointing at the evolutionary explanation of why something um, evolved by natural selection. So stating the selected effect function is giving a summary or a sketch of the scientific explanation of how this thing came into existence. And this recent author I talked about um, a few moments ago, Justin Garson, um, exactly the same thing uh, 20 years later, actually goodness, 30 years later, I've been doing this for too long. 30 years later, we find Justin Garson saying exactly the same thing. If we take explanatory depth seriously, then the traditional selected effects theory or something in its neighborhood has no equal. So the idea is selected effect functions are the real or the true functions because they explain why things exist. It's not, we don't just look at something and describe it as having a function. If we're talking about these functions, these are the functions that are why those things exist, why they are the way they are. They explain the things that have the functions. The functions explain the traits that have the functions. So that's the idea that I want to call into question. So in this recent paper, um, uh, what we did was to take all of the definitions of function in the philosophy literature and try to come up with a canonical statement of the theory a really careful, rigorous statement of how to define an SE function. I won't give you a list of them, but they're in, in the, the published version of this paper. And if you're interested, the um, although this paper won't come out till next year, it's available on the Phil Papers database. So you can, you can download it as a a preprint from Phil Papers. Um, uh, we give a whole series of definitions, and none of the published definitions in the philosophy literature contain enough detail to develop the definition of selected effect function in the philosophy literature so that it was clear and detailed enough that if we take some real evolutionary science, we can apply the definition and grind the handle and out comes the function description. So rather than a, a oh, loose oh, verbal- The connection seems not good. Uh, 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 could you try now? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Please restart um, from uh, uh, several sentences before. <laughs> okay, right. Um, so, uh, the, the um, canonical statement of the theory that I have on the current slide is done, so maybe you can't hear me again. Uh, 
Oh. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll, okay, I'll just carry on. Um, okay. We, we're trying to state, yeah, we're trying to state the theory carefully enough that given a whole bunch of actual biological information, we can tell exactly what the function is. So we can actually apply the theory to some rules. Um, rather than in detail, I'll just explain um, a um, In order to think about something selected function, you need a first function to have some for example, might have a population of birds, and some of those birds are blue. And so the characters you at character in the living organisms is the same thing as the blue character in their ancestors. That's what we mean by saying that the character states must be missed. You need to have some living organisms. You need to be able to measure something about them, like what color they are. And you need to know that they had ancestors who were the same color and that the, the color they're talking about in their ancestors is same thing as the color that you're looking at. So then we uh, uh, the definition says that this character, if there be variation in that trait in the ancestral population, there has to be variation in C. And you need that because if there's no variation in C, then natural selection can't have operated. So we need to know that there was variation for natural selection to act on. Then the second clause of the definition says, having C must have caused some of your ancestors to perform the function better than and other individuals. What condition two does is to establish a causal between the eight being might be attracted, says that performing that function increases your biological fitness. It causes you to reproduce more effectively. And obviously we need that for evolution to, to operate. And then clause four says that because these things, 7.1 to 7.3 are true, that influences that the change over time in what the organisms looked like was affected. And when all four conditions are satisfied, then this function f is a selected effect function of the trait. So it's much easier to understand with a concrete example. Um, if you have a, uh, so 7.1 would be something like, uh, there was an ancestral population in which some of the birds were blue and some of the birds were brown. And 7.2 says, um, being blue, was more attractive to mates than being brown in that ancestral population. So the female birds preferred the blue males. 7.3 says um, being attractive to females caused those ancestral birds to have more offspring. And 7.4 says the fact that these ancestral birds had this advantage in having more offspring actually changed the number of bluebirds there are and that's got something to do with why we see so many birds in the current population at the moment so it's really just a, a trying to say in a fairly detailed way what do we mean when we say that this trait was 
designed by natural selection to serve some function. So spelling that out in a lot of detail. Okay, so we've got a long, a long and very careful definition of selected effect function. The nice thing about that is that now we can actually um, ask rigorously what is the selected effect function for some real organism. So, in what sense, if these, so the idea is that selected effect functions define the way I've just given you, are meant to explain the traits that have them. So, if the function of the blue color of the bird is to attract females, then, then that is meant to explain why the birds are blue. Okay. So, in what sense, what does explain mean here? I mean, you're doing flaw science, you can't use a word like explain without cash. In that, in the sense that the actual, when we take the actual evolutionary explanation, by which we mean the explanation found in the scientific literature, and we feed that scientific information into the definition, the resulting function description should be a summary or a sketch of the actual evolutionary explanation. So if we have um, the bluebird I was thinking about was the Australian fairy wren, which is incredibly beautiful, shining blue bird. Males are blue, the females are brown. Um, if we take the real science, so we go to the relevant journals, we pull out the articles, and we actually now have the real, the actual scientific explanation of why fairy wrens are blue. The idea is that when we feed that scientific information into the definition, the resulting function description should give us back the scientific. So, in this case, the result function description is the function of the is to attract female wrens. And that's a reason the blue head, the thing that has the function. So we can be a bit more detailed about that. Um, an idea that many of you will be familiar with um, in philosophy of science is the idea of the ideal explanatory text. Now that's a, a theoretical entity, but it's an idea suggested by the philosopher Peter Relton. Um, he says, imagine, that there is a database that contains all of the information about an event that's needed to answer any why question we might pose about that event. So the ideal explanatory text is a, an ideal scientific database. It contains all the information we need in order to explain, sorry, to answer any explanatory question we might have about something. And a scientific explanation extracts some of that information. And a good scientific explanation extracts the right information to answer a specific question. That's roughly the idea. So we can apply that framework to think about how selective effect functions explain things. So, sorry, Surgeon, sorry, which the selected definition of function is implicitly the circumstances. So the, the, the connection is really bad. And uh, maybe uh, let's try if you turn off your video uh, to see if the connection is better, because uh, we are certain that it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, how is, is that better now? Can you hear me better? Yeah, yeah. It seems better. Okay. So, I will um, go on. Um, uh, it's a uh, public holiday in Australia today. So, I'm doing this from home. 
which may explain the bad internet connection, whereas for tomorrow's lecture. Uh, okay, so as you can see on the slide, the question that the SC definition of function asks is, what were the circumstances under which the trait increased fitness? And the theory implicitly assumes that by answering that question, we're also answering the question, why did this trait evolve? But my, my point is uh, going to be that those two questions are often not equivalent. That often, if the question we want to answer is, why did this trait evolve? Then the selected effect definition of function will extract the wrong information from the ideal explanatory text. It will give you the wrong answer. So I need to explain that now. And the easiest way to explain it is with a real example. So uh, these little birds on the right are Australian Gouldian finches, and they are the same species of bird. So when you go to Northern Australia, you see these beautiful birds in big flocks in the desert. Some of them have red heads and some of them have black heads. And this is, um, has been analyzed and shown to be an example of a very famous evolutionary model, part of the theory of evolution. Um, it's a model called the hawk dove game. So again, I'm not gonna go through the maths because this is all very, very well known kind of textbook biology. So I'll just explain how this works in fairly simple terms. So um, in evolution, a hawk dove game occurs when there are two competing kinds of organisms in the population. One of them is an aggressive individual which likes to fight, and the other one is a non-aggressive individual that doesn't like to fight. And you, get, you can get a dynamic in which neither of these strategies can win. So the way the dynamic works is that when a hawk meets a hawk, there's always a fight. And on average, there's a very big cost because somebody always gets hurt. When a dove meets a dove, there's no cost. It's just random which one of them gets the resources they're fighting. The resources they're not fighting over. So imagine two birds who arrive at the same piece of food and one of whichever one decides to run away first, nobody fights anybody. One of them, one of them always runs away. Um, when a hawk meets a dove, the dove runs away, and the hawk always gets the resource, whatever it might be. Um, so you get these four um, uh, different kind of interactions. You get the the disastrous situation where a hawk meets a hawk, and somebody always gets hurt. You get the kind of random situation where a dove meets a dove and somebody gets the resource, but it's random who gets it. And you get the situations where a hawk meets a dove and then the hawk always wins. Now, what will happen with many particular values in this matrix is that the two kinds of animal will exist in the population in a balance. If there are too many hawks, then being a hawk becomes too expensive, you get into too many fights, you get hurt too often, and then natural selection will increase the number of doves. But if there are too many doves, then being a hawk is a really winning strategy, you hardly ever have to fight, and you always get the resources. So you get a balance between these two strategies, the hawk strategy and the dove strategy. This is a very widely um, theoretically used model, and what's really nice about the, uh, the Gouldian finches is that they're a real animal which seems to be evolving in accordance with this model. So the red-headed finches are very aggressive and they always fight to obtain nesting sites. And the black-headed finches are not aggressive and if they, somebody contests a nesting site, they run away. So the, uh, the black-headed finches are the dove-like birds, or the red-headed finches are the aggressive hawk-like birds. And this is mediated by a difference in the hormone levels of the two kinds of birds. The red-headed birds have high levels of testosterone and corticosteroids. So at a hormonal level, they're all hyped up, 
ready to fight. And the, uh, the little black-headed birds are lower levels of testosterone and corticosteroids. They're relaxed, chill. They don't want to fight anybody. And in the natural population, you see about 25% redheads and 75% black birds. It turns out that being a redheaded bird has some really serious costs. The redheaded birds put so much effort into fighting that they're actually they raise as many young as the black headed birds. The black headed birds may use it for bringing up their babies more successfully. So actually, the black headed strategy, about 75% of the birds. Now, in the, the published paper, we do a whole bunch of examples of real evolutionary explanations, and we apply the selected effect function idea to each of the real explanations that we, um, that we describe. So here's what happens with the hawk dove game. Um, look, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This, this is what happens on what I've got on this slide is what happens when you take the definition of selected effect function and apply it to the real biology of the Gordian finch. But what matters is the last line. Um, you end up saying that the elevated levels of testosterone have the function of defeating rivals for nesting cavities. Okay, so when you apply the selected effect function, it tells you what the function of the elevated level of testosterone trait is to defeat rivals for nesting holes. The tr trouble is that that's a very bad explanation of how the Gordian finches evolved. Um, so the frequency of the elevated trait in the current population and the answer given by the selected effect theory is the frequency of elevated is explained by its function of defeating rivals for nesting cavities. But the actual evolutionary explanation, the explanation that biologists give you, is that selection is what's called frequency dependent. Frequency of a trait depends on how common it is in comparison to its rivals. So the explanation of why we see 25% redheaded birds is that that's the equilibrium frequency in a frequency dependent selection game. The reason that we see them is not because they're really good at defeating rivals for nesting cavities, it's because that's the equilibrium frequency where it's okay to defeat rivals that often go down. Okay, so what we've got is a selection scenario where the key fact is that these two types interact with each other and establish an equilibrium. But the selected effect function explanation doesn't tell you that. It just gives you some information about why the elevated redheaded type was sometimes fitter than the reduced type. So, for example, you would think that if the function of the red-headed type is to defeat rivals for nesting cavities, then if it, was to, if it was even better at defeating rivals for nesting cavities, then it would evolve even more. You'd expect to see more of them. But of course, in the real evolutionary explanation, that's not right. If it was better at defeating rivals for nesting cavities, the costs would go up. Um, if there were more red-headed birds, um, again, the cost would go up and the equilibrium ratio of the two types would be driven down to, to where we see it at 25 and 75%. So what we argue is that the selected effect function explanation misrepresents how elevated evolved. It says it evolved because it increases your fitness in some areas of the environment. And that's one part of the story, but the key part of the story is that it's sometimes good for you, sometimes bad for you, 
and there's an equilibrium ratio where it's just good enough and just bad enough to survive at that ratio. It's in a balance between two opposing forces. So it's a bit like um, uh, if you have a... Uh, 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 and you asked somebody, why is that thing not falling? And somebody said, because it's being suspended by a magnet and didn't tell you that it was being pulled down by the force of gravity. Or alternatively, if somebody said, why is that ball not falling? And sorry, why is that ball staying still? And you answered by saying, it's staying still because it's being pulled down by the force of gravity. And you didn't mention the fact that it was being pulled up by magnet. So the, the explanation is that this thing is an equilibrium between two forces, but the selected effect function explanation gives you one of those forces and doesn't mention the other one. Okay. Um, so we think that this is a very general problem with selected effect function explanations. Selected effect function explanations always, to use the, the English idiomatic phrase, they always look on the bright side. They always look at the good stuff in the evolutionary scenario, and they never look at the bad stuff in the evolutionary scenario. And we can see that in actually in some of the ways that Ruth Millikan introduces the idea of selected effect function. So Millikan um, has this idea of what it is for something to be normal. And she uses a capital N to indicate that this is a special technical sense of normal rather than um, you know, that it's a technical locution. So she says that the normal conditions for the evolution of a trait are the conditions in which the trait has historically been when it actually performed F. And then this thing about, you know, so basically what she's saying is if you want to understand the evolution of a trait, look at the occasions in evolutionary history when that trait was successful. And hopefully there'll be enough uniformity that when it's successful, it's successful in pretty much the same way. That's the second bit. And then she says that a normal explanation of a trait is one that explains how it performs its function under these normal conditions. So what Millikan says is, if you want to understand a trait, you should look at the historical situations in which the trait was successful, in which it performed its function successfully. And then she says that those normal conditions, those aspects of the evolutionary historical environment, quote, are the conditions to which the device that performs the proper function is biologically adapted. And she uses the word device where I use the word trait. But the trouble is that that's not actually how an evolutionary explanation works. Um, in, in evolution, a trait is not adapted to the conditions under which it did well. It's adapted to the weighted average of the environments in which it actually found itself in evolution, both the good environments and the bad environments. So for the, to understand what historical conditions a trait is adapted to, you need to know about the abnormal environments as well as the normal environments. So one of the other examples we work with in the paper is um, the way that plants will adapt the germination of their seeds to the fact that some seasons are wet and some seasons are dry. And you, it's no good just thinking about the occasions when the seed landed in a good, rich, wet environment and grew successfully in order to understand the plants, what the plant is adapted to, it's adapted to both the good seasons where the seed was able to germinate and to the bad seasons where the seed wasn't able to germinate. And the trait that evolves will depend on what's the least, so it depends on how well you do when things go really badly, as well as how well you do when things go well. And it depends on the weighted average of those two. So the the historical factors that explain the evolution of the trait are not what Millikan calls the big N normal conditions. They're the weighted average of her normal conditions and what she calls abnormal conditions. 
So evolution is about what happens when things go wrong as well as when things go right. So in essence, what the selected effect definition of function does is to take the actual evolutionary explanation of a trait and select the information that would be relevant, posed predominantly of patches where the trait does well. So it, it looks at every evolutionary scenario and extracts the information that would be relevant if the evolution of the trait was primarily the result of it finding itself in a good place and defeating its rival. But when the evolution of the trait is a mixture of it finding itself in a good place and defeating its alternatives and finding itself in a bad place and actually doing less well than its alternatives, and what evolves as a result of the interaction of these different patches of the environment, then you basically um, throw away half of the explanation. So, conclusion. The aspiration of selected effect function theories is to identify the proper functions of traits. It's a theory that's meant to identify the real or the true functions. And because of that, it's meant to be, to be able to assess whether traits are normal or pathological intact or broken, well-functioning or dysfunctioning. So the selected effect theory is meant to give you the real, the, the, the genuine functions. Now, the claim that this theory is the, gives you the true or the genuine functions of things rests on the idea that these functions, as opposed to any other way of defining biological function, this picks out the properties that causally explain the existence of the traits that bear those functions. I've given you one example in the paper, we give a whole series of examples where we basically say that whenever traits evolve in heterogeneous environments, that can either be exogenous, the environment can just have different patches where different traits do well or badly, or it can be endogenous, internally produced heterogeneity of the environment. And that's what you get with frequency dependent selection. So the key to understanding frequency dependent selection is that what trait is the good trait depends on how many of them there are relative to their competitors. So of course, you're all familiar with the, um, I don't know what the name of the Chinese name of it is, but you must have the same children's game of um, rock, paper and scissors, where each of you has to say whether you're a scissors or a piece of paper or a rock. And depending on what choice you make, you win or lose. And of course, scissors, scissors beats paper, but paper beats rock. So you never know what the right strategy is because it depends on what your opponent chooses. Well, evolution, of course, is like that a lot of the time. So in order to say which trait is better, you have to know what's happened in the past in evolution. And as evolution proceeds, which trait is the better trait changes over time. And so that's an internally or endogenously produced heterogeneity of the selected environment. So when you have that, either exogenous or endogenously produced heterogeneity, selected effect functions don't explain the traits that bear them. Now, it's almost always true that a trait's selected effect function tells you something which is of some explanatory relevance to the evolution of the trait. It pulls out some relevant information and gives it to you. But the selection of information it makes is not a good sketch or a summary of why the thing exists in evolutionary terms, except in these simple cases with a uniform environment and a constant fitness function. So if the selected effect theory is to do what it wants to do, we argue that it needs to be restated using a realistic understanding of how evolution explains traits and not assuming that all traits evolve because they do something which is consistently good and that's why they exist. Because a lot of the time in evolution, things don't evolve because they do something that's consistently good. They do something which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Other traits sometimes win and sometimes lose and a dynamic process at the population level leaves you at the end of that with either one trait winning or the traits existing in some kind of balance, some kind of equilibrium state. Good, that's it. 
and we'll go to questions. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we are now taking questions first from the room. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand and uh, speak up. Uh, uh, yeah, open your videos. <laughs> Uh, uh, Wang Yuzhou, uh, this is our new staff. Uh, uh, he's, uh, could you uh, sit here and then who can see you? All right. So um, thank you for the uh, speech. And um, um, so my question is about the um, uh, the example you gave, the Golden uh, Finches example. So I'm wondering if we could solve the problem by uh, specifying the uh, the proper function of the uh, elevated uh, individuals. So, for example, if we, we say that the proper function is uh, for the elevated individuals, it's not to defeat the rivals, but to defeat other elevated uh, individuals, but also to say. Um, scare away or win uh, over the uh, uh, the reduced individuals without a fight. So it, it seems that if we, be, we are being more specific about the proper functions, then we can still use the uh, same explanation. And it's, it seems to make sense to say that, well, this is why we have those elevated individuals because you know, the proper function can explain you know, the, 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 why they have those traits. So that's my question. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good suggestion. But the problem is that um, if the red-headed individuals scare away too many black-headed individuals, they actually reduce their fitness. So the the fitness of red-headed individuals is maximized when there's only twenty five percent of them. If there's more than twenty five percent of them, so if they're too successful, what what keeps the population in equilibrium is that if you succeed too often, your fitness goes down. Um, so, and in fact, when the, the black headed individuals, um, the funny thing is that, uh, the, the black headed individuals, um, uh, are as it were winning when they lose the bet, because if the black headed individuals were to, um, the fact that they, they flee is in fact winning for them. Okay. Because they're conserving resources for other activities. So I think a version of what you're, you're saying works quite well. Um, you need to say something like the function of the red-headed phenotype is to win, but not to win too often, or it's to to win um, to it's to win just often enough that the cost of winning doesn't exceed um, uh, the cost of losing. And the point about that is that then you have to mention the other guys. So we're not saying that you can't have a selective head kind of function. We're saying that the definition has to um, mention um, not just what did it do that was good for you, but how did it play a role in the dynamic evolution of the population? Okay, so if you look, it's if you that's why we were very careful to target that definition. So the challenge is for proponents of the SE function theory um, to restate the definition so that instead of telling you to measure how well the trait does when it's doing well. It shows you how to measure that, to measure how well it does when it's doing badly, and to integrate those in the way that evolutionary theory actually integrates them. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. So you, you need to, but you need to ha actually have quite a sophisticated, um, also I would, would argue that the, the real, the way that a biologist thinks about this case is fundamentally, they don't think about the uh, red-headed individuals in isolation from the black-headed ones. They think of it as a, a balanced system. Um, and so again, one of the problems with the existing literature on selected effect function is that it always directs you to ask, what does it do for the individual, rather than how does it function in the larger system of which that individual is a part? And when you do that, if, if so when you, and again, I think one of the, the kind of more interesting things that will happen if, if people take this criticism seriously, is that it actually will, um, the functions that you ascribe will not be the ones that um, are ascribed by common sense. They're not the ones that seem intuitive to us in the first place. 
And that's going to have a big impact on people who want to use this theory to explain mental illness or to do evolutionary ethics or to talk about mental representation. So in other words, if the, if the functions are, are strange and unusual, they may not give us what we want. People are assuming that evolution will give them back the intuitive function, the one that they want to believe in. And we think that needs to be proved and that you need to, if you have a really biologically developed theory, we can actually find out whether or not the theory gives people the right answers in these various philosophical applications of the theory. But yes, you're on the right track. What needs to be done is to rebuild the theory with more sophisticated account of how biology explains things. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, just a quick follow up. So I'm, uh, what worry I have is just that um, uh, maybe are you just um, um, asking too much from this uh, explanation from a proper function? So for example, like I wouldn't expect to uh, say people try to explain why there are 25% of the redhead rather than say 26 or 27, because that, that would, uh, it, it seems that a, uh, explanation only needs to be uh, specific to a certain extent. It does not have to you know, really uh, explain everything that we know about something. Yeah, so. no, it's again, very good question. Um, I think the people who are writing responses to the paper, um, the invited commentators are, um, the two that I've read already are proposing to read, to, to restate what it is that selected effect function is meant to explain. But that I take to be philosophical progress because all the existing literature says it explains why it exists. And now people are saying subtler things like, oh, it explains why things appear to be designed or it explains why things are often, you know, um, performing some useful role for the animal. And these are quite different questions from the one that's that's been stated up to now. So again, you know, the, the idea of this is not that select effect function theory is, is has to, you know, be abandoned, but that it, and if you, once you say that, you then have to go back to these claims about normativity and see whether they still work. So we're really hoping that this target article will lead to a, a really progressive discussion about how to make the theory better. But the two suggestions you've made are in exactly the right direction. You go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Zhang Mingjun uh, online. Maybe because we are anyone in the room to, to, to ask a question. Then uh, Mingjun, could you please speak up? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, like I just feel like a little bit confused about the kind of the, the discussion, the background of discussion. If if the a function is defined in terms of the like the process of natural selection, why don't we just use the theory of natural selection to explain the uh, the evolution of trees? Why do we why why do other people try to use the notion of function to explain the good? Uh, yeah. the evolution of tree we can just see that oh be according to the theory on natural selection this treat evolves I, I think i think this theory is also compatible with the game theoretical uh, cases uh, that you use as the counter examples because even in that case we can see that there is a frequency dependent selection and that's all so it seems that the theory on natural selection can be used as a general framework to explain all the cases like, why do we have to appeal to the notion of function, which is defined in terms of natural selection? I just feel so confused about the motivation Good. for those people to do yeah. that. Thanks. That's, a, again, really helpful question. I think that's, yeah. So what the people, if you go and read the biologists who introduced the idea of teleonomy, they are doing something much less problematic and more in line with your response. So they are just trying to say, look, um, there's a general sense in which sometimes it looks as if there's some design or things are there for a reason in nature. And now we can make that all seem, you know, very straightforward. They tend not to talk about function. They just talk about, you know, that, that organisms look as if they're goal directed or organisms look as if they have purposes. And we want to explain that by saying, look, that's just the result of natural selection. The philosophers who've got involved in this since the 1980s, for them, it's essential 
that they can translate the scientific explanation from evolution into the much older philosophical vocabulary of what is it for? What is it meant to do? Is it doing it right? Is it performing its proper function? Because the whole philosophical project is to use evolutionary theory. And nobody's arguing that there are great, I mean, so in, in the paper, we look at frequency dependent selection, we look at bet hedging scenarios when organisms don't do what's best under any one circumstance. They um, they do something that's not the best thing in every individual circumstance. But if you're going to just do the same thing all the time, it's the best compromise. And we look at cases where the environment is patchy and changing. And they're all well understood. None of those cause any problems for evolutionary theory. We have the maths to do with them all. But what the philosophers want to do is to translate that science into claims about what's right and wrong, good and bad, healthy and unhealthy, right? And so the reason that they need to translate that into the language of function and what is that? They want to be able to say whether the, um, uh, the red-headed bird is doing it right or doing it wrong. They want to be able to say whether the red-headed bird is succeeding or failing. So the translation into the language of function is to allow you to, and then the big projects here are one that um, I've been writing about myself the last few years in the philosophy of medicine, to be able to give an objective definition of what a healthy organism is. A healthy organism is one where every part of the organism is performing its correct function. Another philosophical project has been to um, uh, as I say, to explain what it is for a, a mind to correctly represent the world. And that's Ruth Millikan's project, that um, your mind correctly represents the world when it represents it in the way that is the mind performing its proper function. So you define what it is for a representation to be true or correct or accurate in terms of what the brain is meant to do. What is the function of the brain? What is its proper function? And you define that in terms of, um, uh, of, the, of appealing to this definition of selected effect function. So exactly, for scientific purposes, we can probably ditch the language of function. But for the purposes where philosophy wants to appeal to biological teleology to do normative work in philosophy, okay, um, then, you know, absolutely, you've got to translate it into the language of function. So the challenge we're making is that that translation into the language of function is much harder than it looks. And when you do it right, it may not give you functions that are the ones you want that help that allow you to do that philosophical work. It might not define, in other words, the philosophical project is to say our intuitions about what's proper, right, normal, healthy can be cashed out in scientific terms using this way of defining function in terms of evolution. And the challenge we're making is it's harder to do than you think. And if you do it right, it may not give you the answers you need. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, can I have a quick follow up? Yeah, I just. Ah, yeah. Like, yeah, so thanks. And my thing, I think maybe we philosophers will change our research projects according to what scientists say, because in this case, it seems very and reasonable to insist that there we can have a kind of a normative theory about function even in those uh, frequency dependent cases maybe it's just um difficult or even impossible to do that i don't know well, yeah there are, there are other theories of function Mingzhu. so um i yeah, i talked in the beginning of the talk about cybernetic approaches to function so there there are a bunch of philosophers who actually have a completely different definition of function um, mm -hmm. which comes from, from cybernetics and theories of complexity. So another thing you might do is to say, this theory is not working very well. We're going to change to a different philosophical theory of function. That's yeah. another potential response. Yeah. 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 And in the in the last slide, you said the selected effect theory needs to be reformulated in order to uh, answer those questions, in order to explain how trees evolved. But I think even we can do that. Uh, those theories cannot explain the ev evolution of all trees because we all know that not uh, the natural selection is only one of, 
of many evolution factors that can influence the evolution of trees. For many trees, for many trees, we cannot explain their evolution uh, only in terms of uh, the process of natural selection, because for in many cases, like maybe it's due to genetic drift and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yes. very so, very sensible comment, and that's what I'm talking about in tomorrow's lecture. Absolutely. So yeah, tomorrow that's exactly the question I want to move on to tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wenjing, and uh, we have another uh, two questions from the uh, online audience. Uh, whose name is Li Xin Yu? Xin Yu, could you uh, uh, turn on your mic and uh, just uh, speak directly to Paul? Okay, can you hear my voice? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your talk. And I, my question is that uh, is as in theories apply to individual or population, or it doesn't have any limitation. And um, and the follow up question is: It seems that frequency dependence is a group trait ra rather than individual trait. So why not we say that? The function of keeping a proper uh, frequency of the population that makes someone being selected. So that's my question. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so I think there is. Um, so just to, to pick up that last thing that you said first, um, if you move the function to the level of the population, which is a perfectly sensible thing to do. Um, you then get um, descriptions of particular functions that are very far away from our kind of intuitions about health and disease and about what's normal and abnormal. So that might be a good thing, but what most people want this theory to do is to reconstruct what seems intuitively right to them. And if you shift to the population level, um, you get rather unintuitive functions, um, mainly because the functions are no longer of, of individuals but of, of as you say of populations so um but to the main part of your question uh there is a real very interesting distinction between the way that the philosophical literature talks about these issues and the way that biologists actually deal with them in in scientific practice and so joshua christie who's the first author on this paper um was a, a postdoc uh, of mine for a few years, and he's a um, evolutionary modeler. So he's somebody who, you know, builds evolutionary models for a living, the real things. Um, and Josh always found it very strange that philosophers seem to want to talk about the evolution of Paul's body or the evolution of Dr. Uh, Chai Ying Lu's body, and not about the human body, which is what real biologists think about. They don't think about my body or your body. They think about the human body in general, or the body of this population or this lineage of individual groups. Um, so when you look at uh, a lot of the writing of Ruth Millikan, it's as if what she wants to do is to take the individual organism she's looking at, you know, the particular bird with a particular blue head, and then look at its grandparents and its great grandparents and ask, how did they do well in life? And how did they do badly in life? And explain you know, um, Paul, the little one, one little individual bird or one little individual human in terms of how their particular ancestors did. But of course, you know, evolutionary theory doesn't work like that. Evolutionary theory works by doing the statistics of populations. So I think there are one interesting avenue of research, which is worth thinking about, is whether or not one reason that um, this approach seems so attractive to philosophers is that they're not thinking in terms of the dynamics of evolving populations. They're more thinking about evolution as if it was the history of a family, you know, so, you know, Uncle John did well and, you know, Auntie Mary did badly, and as if it's like that for animals, which of course is not how evolutionary theory actually works. And if that's how to make the theory, so it's actually a discussion I've had with some other philosophers. If that's how you want to develop the theory, then you're not really appealing to the theory of evolution. You're kind of constructing a new science of your own, because, you know, as you know, biology is about populations and statistics. It's not about family lineages and what happened to this particular uncle and this particular grandfather, right? That's a different 
I mean, we don't have a science of that for good reason that it's not a, a very science, not a not the kind of thing you can study in a rigorous and quantitative way. But I do think when I read some of Ruth Millikan's, it's as if she looks at a particular brain and she wants to look at lots of ancestors of that brain for each one think about its life and what went well and badly. And that's kind of weird from a scientific point of view, but that's, yeah. So yeah, the one of the problems, so just to quickly answer your question in a single sentence, one of the things that's going on in this debate is that sometimes it's not clear whether we're talking about an individual or whether we're talking about that individual as just an example of a type or a population. I think there's again more philosophical work to do on sorting that out. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm. Thank you. And uh, we have any questions from the room? Uh, uh, we have another question from uh, Zhou Li Qian. Uh, uh, Li Qian, could you? Yeah, we can yeah, see yeah. you. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, you attacked uh, the you know, especially Millikan's points and uh, normal condition is different from this weighted average environment. And because the normal condition only gets the bright side. But mm -hmm. however, according to the definition of normal condition you gave in the slides, it only says that, uh, you know, uh, VF actually existed in the past or historically. I cannot see this normative claims bad or good. It, if F existed historically, it is, it was normal condition. So I, I really cannot get this uh, yeah. only bright side. Yeah. It's very confusing because the way that we know, the way we use the word normal, typically in evolutionary theory, we mean what occurred in history. Okay. But the way that Millikan uses the word normal, that's why she, she uses the capital letter to show that she's introducing a new technical term. So whenever she uses the word, she puts a capital letter to show that it's not the everyday word, it's a technical word. And so for her, the normal environment is the environment in which the trait succeeded in performing its function. So the example she normally uses, which is slightly um, designed to shock um, it's designed to kind of, you know, wake up her audience, is that um, the average environment for a sperm is one in which it never sees an egg. But for her, the big end normal environment for a sperm is one in which there is a female egg. Okay, so she's basically saying to understand the evolution of um, sperm, you only need to think about the lucky sperm who found a female egg. And that's very different from the way that an evolutionist would think about it, where you need to think about the lucky and the unlucky ones, and you need to average that. Okay, you need, average is just the simplest way of doing it. So you need to think about what happens when something fails as, when it, as well as when it succeeds. Whereas Millikan thinks that um, some things, you can think about what something's function is only by looking at the big end normal. The, the, the uh, cases in which the environment provided everything that was required for something to succeed in performing its function. And she's got reasons for thinking that. I mean, it's not like she's just making that up. Yeah, um, it's because she, she wants to define truth. So she wants to say that the, the normal environment for a thought is the environment in which the thought is true. Okay, so she wants to think about the, yep. Yeah. And now, obviously, yeah, yeah. in an evolutionary terms, most thoughts are false. Most of us are full of rubbish, right? <laughs> okay. but, yeah, 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 the yeah, normal yeah. thing is to be wrong. But for Millikan, to be big end normal is for your thoughts to be right. And the normal environment is the one in which your thought is true. So it's a very different way of thinking from the, you know, thinking about the, yeah. The biology. Yeah. I would. What I would say the way biologists yeah, yeah, think yeah. about environments. Is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, Thank it's you. quite hard to understand, right? It's it's a whole yeah, different yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. Because I have read Millikan's works for many years, but I still cannot catch this normal condition. Yeah. But thank mm -hmm. you. It's okay. now much clearer. Yeah. Uh, I I have a follow up for uh, Li Qian's question because uh, uh, 
I totally agree that it is time to uh, for philosophers to learn more about biology and the evolutionary biology, of course, and uh, should not uh, be naively thinking about what they think about biology is and evolution is. I agree about that uh, with that, but maybe when philosophers uh, uh, like want to exploit or use the uh, uh, selected effect function accounts, uh, the definition they are using it in, uh, for different like purpose. Uh, as as uh, you have just said, Bruce Millikan want to define truth uh, for representational uh, uh, propositions like, and uh, they uh, maybe she just uh, uh, choose some part of the SE function account and uh, to define it and uh, which is. Uh, 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 about the normal capital normal condition, then for other philosophers, they might uh, want to use it in another way. Uh, do you think it's uh, legitimate to do that? Or, or uh, you are suggesting that we should anchor on what uh, scientists said uh, and the period, and uh, uh, philosophers should just listen to what biologists uh, and their, uh, uh, sci what science tells them. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, uh, we have our own projects in philosophy, but one of the things that we um, that happens very often in philosophy is that we want we want to know that an idea makes sense or that it will work, that it will succeed in explaining something or it will be well defined. And then we by getting ideas from the sciences, we have a kind of background guarantee that the idea is well defined or that it it's, succeeds in playing a particular role in explanation and we also have this nice thing which is often very reassuring that we think okay we've thought it through in a kind of general way but if we need to know more of the detail we can go to the scientists to actually think like this and get lots more detail and work it out right so yeah. the trouble is if you say my way of thinking about the evolution of representations is independent of the real evolutionary biology of represent of, because you know there is a, a whole field in at least in very abstract mathematical evolutionary theory that looks at the evolution of signaling and information so in one part of our paper we we look at what actual models of the evolution of signaling are like in biology and contrast that to millikan's accounts of the evolution of representation um if you say my project is independent of the scientific project, then you now have to prove that it can actually be done, that it actually works. You can't say, oh, look, you know, I'm just applying this scientific project, which we know is at least sensible and probably works. And I'm just going to apply that to this new topic in philosophy because you're not doing that. Now you've actually got to work out the detail. So in a review of one of Millikan's books a few years ago, um, you know, my comment was simply Millikan describes how uh, so she, you're quite right about particularly about Millikan's work. Um, many of the other people in this literature are trying to directly apply evolutionary theory to the mind. Millikan is is doing something and, you know, I didn't do her for it's very hard to do. She's such a complicated and interesting philosopher that um, if you lump her together with other people, you always misrepresent her work. Right. Um, but so she is trying to think about the evolution of language in its own right. So she's trying to think about language as an evolving system. The populations are made up of strings of symbols and they're competing for representation in the future of people saying things, right? So it's a really very separate project. But when she describes that project, she, dis she just assumes that, for example, um, that representations will differ in fitness and that those differences in fitness can be used to explain which representations are most commonly found in, in future states of the language, right? Now, actually, there's nothing in the basic, if you look at the, the mathematics of populational change, it's just applying, say, the price equation, right? There's no reason why the, the system of language should be such that that's how things change over time. OK, if transmission bias and coming back to I know you're a fan of the price equation, right? If transmission bias drowns out selection, then Millikan's whole account won't work. But our point roughly is that um, 
if you're going to talk about evolution, you can either say, I'm just deferring to the scientists because I, you know, evolution will work because the scientists have done that, in which case you have to do it the way they do it. If you want to say, no, this is a separate philosophical project, it's got not evolutionary theory as you know it in biology, this is a, a new use of evolutionary thinking. And of course, that's great. And there are lots of people who've done that. Ava Jablonka is doing that at the moment in some very interesting work, right? But if you're going to do that, you've got to actually think, well, hang on, how does evolution work in this new arena of mine? Okay, maybe, I mean, there's, I, I, I just think that, um, you know, uh, if, we're if we're literally thinking of populations of public representations as an evolving population, then we have no idea what those models look like. And assuming that those models will be ones which, um, in which uh, the outcome is the result of, um, uh, that in which there's a well-defined fitness for, for each class of representation. And those fitnesses, you know, are the predominant factor explaining dynamic change over time. I have no idea if that's true. You just make it up out of thin air. So yeah, that's the cost. You can either be a philosopher who defers to science, or you've got a lot of work to do to show that you can actually build your own models and that they do what you say they do. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. We have another question from uh, Professor Liu Zhe. Hi, Paul. Uh, no. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Yes, I can, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I, I'm actually not specialized in, in philosophy or biology, but I'm quite interested in this, in this topic because of the a kind of natural, naturalist appealing in your talk. Because here, as you, you mentioned to begin with, that there is a kind of naturalism which is uh, undergrounding this uh, reduction of teleological normative intuitions to this as the uh, uh, function theory. So I'm just wondering when you try to make that theory complicated, whether we could still uh, gain this, this, this final aim of using this uh, selection theory. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as you explained to another uh, 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 audience, you said the uh, uh, militant uses term the normal in a very spe uh, specific uh, uh, way, namely that concerns the uh, the notion of truth. I think she has the right because she stresses this kind of uh, naturalism, which can really reduce the normative intuition to this naturalist process. But then when you try to expand this, uh, 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 this selection theory, I'm just wondering whether we could still make it. I'm, I'm inclined to think that um, we don't know how successful, so, for the last sort of 30 years, at least English speaking philosophers have assumed that um, the selected effect account of function will, if you, if you were to develop it in detail, would fit with our intuitive understanding of normativity for, say, health and disease, um, for what it is for the mind to be well functioning. I think we, we really don't know that. I think we would need a lot more work to have rational grounds for believing that and that makes a lot more space for other philosophical theories of teleology some of which are um naturalistic and some of which are less naturalistic um and so uh, i actually think that um you know we're you know we're being a bit we have been a bit complacent um about assuming that uh we we all know that we need to think in teleological ways about the world and about the mind and about especially well, life and especially mind. Um, and we've, I think, been so somewhat complacent in assuming that there is an easy way to naturalize that teleology provided by Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, and this actually, so if you look at the work of um, uh, philosophers of mind like Evan Thompson, um, who are trying to give an account of the uh, the teleological nature of living systems in a way that is an emergent property of life itself. Now, their theories are in a very broad sense naturalistic, but they're, they're you know, they, they, are, they do have an emergentist view of the of mind, okay, in which it's not reducible to physical structure. Um, you know, those philosophies uh, look 
you know, they, they get more space to come in and try and explain the teleological character of life and mind uh, because the Darwinian way of thinking about that has a lot more problems than I think we've assumed for the last 30 years. So I think it's an open question whether or not um, a straightforward naturalization of teleology will succeed. And that we, you know, I take very seriously some of these other approaches, both the organizational theories of function and some of these um, uh, approaches for the sort of emergence of teleology along with the nature of life that you find in, in philosophers like Evan Thompson. So I think I think we need to be more open to alternative ways of trying to understand teleology and nature than we have been for the last 30 years by focusing purely on Darwinian approaches, at least in the English speaking world. No. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you for this very inspiring suggestion. Yeah. Okay, uh, any uh, questions? Other questions? Yeah, may maybe the, the information is just too overwhelming and we just <laughs> need time to digest it. <laughs> and perhaps my internet, I will make sure that I have a better internet connection tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Uh, because uh, others are complaining about the internet, that maybe that's why they cannot uh, understand fully. Uh, but uh, thank you for for today's talk. And uh, we have, I at least I have learned a lot and uh, think more about the normativity and the SE function. And uh, uh, we will have uh, another talk uh, tomorrow at the same time. And uh, all audience and online audience are also welcomed. Uh, today we just thank. For uh, his wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And uh, the discussions. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to seeing you over a better connection tomorrow. Okay. Bye bye. See you. See you.